Kia ora koutou katoa and welcome to this community research webinar, an introduction to RBA with me, Jan Hind, with Sharon Shea, and we'll be joined today by Natasha Kemp of Te Kaha o Te Rangatahi. So this is a 60 minute event and we're going to divide it into three parts. The first part will be um, instructional. Sharon will present you with some information to familiarize you with the concepts of RBO. So that leads me to, with very great pleasure, introduce you to Sharon Shea today. So it's my very great pleasure to hand over to you. Kei a koe te rākau. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou Thank you, Jan. Look, it's a great pleasure to be here and thank you to everyone who's joining in. Um, I really value the work that community researchers do to continue to liaise with the organisation to help build um, multiple learning opportunities mm -hmm. and organisations for the benefit of clients and whānau. So I'm just going to do a 20 minute um, overview of RBA. It's a light touch everybody. It's really a, a, a quick introduction. There are additional resources for you um, on the web and we'll present those to you uh, later on. So that slides up. Okay, everybody. So um, one of the key messages about using RBA, and RBA is an acronym for Results-Based Accountability, is how do we work together to improve this and communities. So we're going to have a quick overview today and uh, a little bit of a design session as well. I wanted to point out to you a couple of extra resources for RBA. As you might know, there are some books um, which you can purchase online. So just letting you know. And the benefits of RBA, everyone, wait for it. This is my, um, it's a light touch on this slide, everyone, because I'm talking to the converted. I can hear you laughing as I threw my um, uh, microphone. But anyway, look, um, some of the benefits of RBA I wanted to point, point it out briefly. One of the important things of moving forward in terms of having an outcomes focus is that we create a common language. And one of the things that I often see uh, working across government agencies and working with providers is that we don't have a common language in the outcomes space. So it's really important for us to generate one. Uh, we can use RBA to track achievements, and we'll talk a little bit about that. It's a very inclusive methodology if implemented well. So recognition of partnerships and partners in terms of implementing and achieving outcomes is important. And also it's a very uh, complementary tool in terms of collective impact. So if those of you out there who are using collective impact, I encourage you to also utilize um, RBA in that space. Two important points are using data to drive decision making. I think Natasha Kemp is going to talk a little bit about that from an NGO perspective. And last but not least, there is an outcomes chain, everyone, and I've done some RBA training before. You won't have seen the slide, so I want to talk to you about that because it's really important that we understand who's accountable for what. And in some cases, accountabilities are shared and in others, we hold them as high performing organisations. So I'll speak to that as well. So learning about RBA, everyone, there are three core concepts. We call them 237. 237 from ends to means. You can see them there on the slides. The first two concepts, everyone, are about accountability. So there are two key types of accountability in RBA. One is called population and one is called performance. Population accountability, everyone, is a very simple concept. It's about results or outcomes for a whole population of people, for a whole population of people. And when we measure success at that level, everyone, we use pieces of data called indicators. And indicators are simply those larger scale pieces of data which enable us to quantify whether or not population level results or outcomes are occurring. And as you know, those are those big high level strategic or macro outcomes that government agencies really aspire to um, achieve in conjunction with working with others. So because they are so big, they're not about single organisations in their own right holding accountability. They are about multiple partners sharing accountability at that level. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that as we move forward. So performance accountability, what's that about everyone? It's about uh, your clients and ostensibly client outcomes. Now I'm going to use the terminology clients today everyone but uh, you may not use that terminology but one of the important things for us to do is to make sure that you and I are talking about the right type of outcomes. So when we're in performance land we are talking about client outcomes, the family whanau that you deliver 
services too. And when we measure success at that level, we use pieces of data called performance measures. And performance measures enable us to really showcase your success. And it also enables us to ensure that we're um, measuring the right thing. And um, Garth talks a little bit about that moving forward, so we'll pick up on that as well. Now, in performance accountability land, everyone, this is where the rubber hits the road in terms of contracts. So for those of you who, who have new streamlined contracts, which is a, a new streamlined um, contracting template utilised by multiple government agencies, you'll be familiar with a lot of this um, terminology because RBA is in that. But when you are contracting in a streamlined contracting sense, you will have performance measures in your contracts. And there are three types of performance measures. So let's talk about that. So in RBA, there are three types of performance measures which help us to showcase the success of what you deliver. And they are how much did we do, how well did we do it, but most importantly, is anyone better off? The performance measures or the data associated with is anyone better off equals client outcomes. So whenever you and I talk about is anyone better off, we are talking about whether or not the clients that you deliver services to have achieved an improved outcome. And again, we'll come back to that later on. And last but not least, everybody, seven questions. There are seven questions in RBA which enable you and I to have really good conversations about the ends to the means, the ends to the means. So in RBA, everyone, ends equals outcomes. And as we've talked about just quickly, there are two types of outcomes, a population level outcome and a client outcome. So it's really important that when you and I talk together, we start by identifying what the ends are and then we work out what the means are. Now, the majority of you will already think like that anyway, you know, what are we going to achieve and then how are we going to get there? And that's exactly the um, thinking process that RBA uses. And there are seven questions which enable us to talk about that. Just quickly, two more pieces of terminology, everyone, baseline and turning the curve. A baseline is simply any piece of data in RBA we graph. And then you and I need to understand in which direction do we want that data curve to turn. If we don't have a conversation about that, then you and I aren't really clear about how we're going to measure success. So it's really important that we understand baselines and also in which direction we want the data curve to turn. Now, I know I've done that really quickly, everyone, and later we'll show you some online resources in which I'm talking a little bit uh, slower. But these three concepts are really important in terms of RBA. And if we get these, we're away. So 237, 237 from ends to means. If we get these concepts, we're away. So you and I know there is uh, two types of accountability, population and performance and population accountability land. We are talking about well-being for whole populations. And there you can see some examples of population groups in geographic areas. So Orangatahi youth in Northland, adults in Tauranga families in Auckland. So again, population level outcomes and population accountability is about that big picture stuff. It's about the well-being of whole populations. And as I said briefly before, this is about shared accountability. So it's not about a single organisation, it's about multiple partners sharing accountability for the well-being of a whole population. Now, we drop into performance accountability land when we're talking about the well-being of your clients. So this is about understanding whether or not we're making a positive difference in the lives of clients. So we can have clients of teams, of providers, of programs, of an agency, and also of a system. So a health system, education system, whanau order system. Again, once we're talking about client well-being, we're in performance accountability land. And in contracts that uh, you're, you have with government agencies, but also in terms of your own willingness and desire to showcase that you are making a difference, you would make sure that you would have a set of data that would enable you to showcase the fact that you've made a positive difference in the lives of your clients. And this is where that particular data sets, uh, sits and um, those are performance measures. So here are some uh, quick examples of population uh, outcomes into statements of well-being. So remember at that bigger picture level, everyone, we are talking about whole of population well-being. And so these words are what a friend of mine in ACC calls fat phrases. They're fat phrases because they underpin a lot of meaning associated with what well-being might look like for whole populations of people. So when uh, applying RBA well, you would actually unpack these phrases. 
Okay, so definitions, everyone. Uh, you and I know that there are two types of accountability, population for population wellbeing and performance for clients. At a population level, everyone, when we're looking at trying to understand what population outcomes are, what we need to do is have uh, clear definitions around what is the population outcome that we aspire to contribute to and also what are the indicators that we will use as multiple partners um, to quantify success. So that's what those um, two components there look like. Dropping into performance, everyone, we are interested in understanding whether or not we're making a positive difference in the lives of our clients, okay, in the lives of our clients. And that's where we design or we have three types of performance measures, which are all pieces of data, how much, how well, but most importantly, is anyone better off? Uh, just quickly, I wanted to reinforce the conversation in RBA that what we do is we focus on the end and then we work out how to get there. And there are two ends to means conversations in RBA. When we're looking at the big picture population and we're also looking at our client outcomes, if we look at those two concepts together, the population outcome is our ultimate end point because it's about the well-being of a whole population. And the means are all the different services, uh, programs being delivered because the means contribute to the ends. But there's another conversation, everyone, if we just look in performance, uh, we might be thinking about the end is our client outcome and the means are our microservice delivery. Seven questions from talk to action. We don't have a lot of time to dedicate to this, everyone, but I wanted to let you know that there are seven questions which enable us to actually actively use the data to drive decision making, continuous performance improvements, improvement, service design, all those cool things which Natasha is going to talk to you about. Can I just say that best practice application of RBA actually uses the seven questions? And I have noticed that post-design, everyone takes a bit of a breath and then just um, collects data. But the whole point is using data to drive decision making to showcase success. So I really encourage you to use the seven questions. All right, so now we know the difference between population and performance. Let's make sure we understand the relationship between the two. So the next slide enables us to talk about um, how population and performance fit together. So just quickly, everyone, the important or takeaway message is this. Clients are subsets of whole populations. Clients are subsets of whole populations. So it's really important that when we're looking at well-being, we look at, at population level well-being and we also look about client well-being and then we seek to understand the relationship between the two. So for example, in a population level, if we're looking at all children in New Zealand and their well-being and or Māori children in New Zealand and their well-being, we're still at that big picture level, aren't we? We're still talking about population level well-being for whole populations of people. But as soon as one of those Māori children actually becomes a client of either the health system, as the example is on the slide there, or becomes a client of a service or program, that's when we need to understand and break down the outcomes associated with them as clients of a system of a service being um, for whole populations of people. So we're actually looking at outcomes at multiple levels. And I think this is one of the real advantages of RBA. The other thing everyone is that we understand that client wellbeing is a critical input into whole of population wellbeing. So we've got to get it right at every level if we're gonna make a positive difference. Our last slides everyone in terms of the intro to RBA is next where we talk about the relationship between population and performance. So there you can see there, Ministry of Health is doing a, doing a, a great job, Peter Kenalina's team in the AOD sector and also Adrian Percy there, thank you for you, enabling us to use this example. So at that big picture level everyone, you can see the population outcome is New Zealand is safe and free from AOD harm. And one of the indicators there are the percentage of New Zealanders who have used meth in the past 12 months. Now, obviously, we want to turn that data curve down because we want to reduce that. So all good, big picture population outcomes, that's fine. But of course, we need to have a way to understand how we translate those outcomes into practice through the effective purchasing or commissioning of services that make a difference in the lives of clients who have an AOD issue. And so that's why in performance accountability land, we start to talk about client wellbeing, client wellbeing associated with services that um, <clears throat> contribute to the bigger picture. 
So in this example, everyone, we've got a quick example there for you. Um, how much, how well, is anyone better off? Sets of performance measures. The client outcomes there, you'll see number of percentage of clients who report they haven't used. So we want to reduce client utilization of meth, uh, oh, sorry, of um, AOD and also clients, you know, proactively engaging in uh, work study or caregiving activities. Uh, those are both examples of positive client behavioural change and they are subjective, they are, fr uh, they are based on the voice of the client. So what's the relationship between the two everyone? It's simply this, what we say is that if we can articulate client outcomes that show that the provider is making a positive difference in the lives of their clients, uh, we can then also understand whether or not those client outcomes actually contribute to those bigger picture population outcomes. So we say there's a contribution relationship between high performing organisations to the bigger picture population outcomes. So it's really important for us to understand that. We don't talk about an attribution at that level because it's very hard, if not impossible to prove, um, the proportionate impact a client outcome has on a population level indicator because there are so many dynamic issues lie between the client outcome and the population level outcome. But it's important to recognise that high performing organisations do have a critical strategic role in terms of delivering client outcomes and also contributing to the big picture. So it really reinforces that in terms of NGOs. Uh, alignment of measures, everyone. We've got a utilisation measure at a client level. We have a utilisation measure at a population level. So there's an alignment of measures there. And last but not least, responsibility. At a population level, it's shared. At a performance level, responsibility for delivering outcomes is held by high performing organisations. So we, we're really clear that it's not appropriate to hold single organisations solely accountable for achieving population level wellbeing. Because if government agencies or the government seek to do that, uh, they're actually setting up organisations to fail. Uh, population level outcomes are about multiple partners working together, but certainly when we drop into service delivery, we are seeking to showcase client outcomes and um, the relationship between client outcomes and higher performing organisations like yourselves. Okay, we're coming up to the end of the um, quick download that everyone on the um, RBA methodology uh, performance measures, as we said, how much, how well any, is anyone better off? Uh, that's just a matrix which shows you how they relate to concepts associated with quantity, with quality, with provider effort and provider effect. But I'm going to jump to the next slide, everyone. Uh, this is what we call your new best mate slide. I think Natasha has this beside her bed at night. Uh, what she, what she forgets to tell me though is that she uses it as a sleep aid. But anyway, um, this slide is a great slide because it's very important. Why is it important? Because it enables us to have a bit more guidance in terms of what a performance measure might look like. Now what I need to really let you know is that RBA is simply a tool, it's a framework. Uh, the the application of it, the integrity of the application is up to us as designers of performance measures, as funders, as, com as commissioners, uh, as, as partners. So it gives us a platform within which we can, which we can use to uh, create effective design. So how much do we do everyone? We're counting the quantity of effort. How well do we do everyone? We're counting the quality of effort. But the most important performance measures are related to are your clients better off? And there are four categories of client outcomes there, some of which you'll be very familiar with. So improved client skills and knowledge, improved client attitude opinion change, improved client behaviour change, improved client circumstance change. So just quickly everyone, a circumstance change is generally a combination of the first three client outcomes, my skills and knowledge improved, my attitude opinion changed, my behaviour changed and then my whole circumstance changed as a client. Um, I've got some codes there everyone, I really encourage people to code their better off so you know we're really sharp in terms of what we're using the data to prove and also uh, we really encourage people to have a nice balance between subjective and objective data. Subjective data is based on the voice of the client, which is really important. We say, hey, we're client-centred, we're person-directed, we're whānau-centred. You know, it's challenging us to actually evidence that through good quality data. And of course, on the voice of the client is as relevant as data, which is objective. So it's not based on the voice of the 
client, it either did or did not happen. Yes, we have challenges in terms of quality uh, data collection, but um, that's another webinar, I think. <laughs> So um, that's just an example for you, everyone. You're going to get the slides, but it just reinforces the use of how much, how well is anyone better off. And this is the outcome slide. Now, I just want to quickly touch on this. There is an accountability chain, as I alluded to before, and basically it's around this. Um, <clears throat> when we seek to purchase or fund or commission effective services, there is a responsibility for high-performing organisations to understand who their clients are in conjunction with conversation with funders, of course, and there isn't in terms of who's accountable for what. So when we talk about the direct clients, the direct clients of providers, not indirect clients, everyone, your most direct client, that's when the rubber hits the road in terms of how do we... Um, how do we deliver outcomes and impact to them? So in some agencies, although the, it's changing, and uh, some agencies have held uh, providers in the past solely accountable for indirect client outcomes. So just be wary of that, everyone. Have a conversation with your funder because um, uh, in RBA we would say that really the, 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 the accountability lies with your most direct client outcomes. Can you give us an example Thanks, of David. that, Sharon? What does an, what, can you give yes, an of course. Of education have done a great job recent what they did historically and um, and there's there was some rationale behind that so uh, but what they had done historically was for um, organizations that deliver professional development services to teachers they were um, looking at uh, those organizations holding accountability for improving student outcomes but actually those organisations didn't engage with students at all. They actually engaged with um, teachers, for example. So the teachers are really the direct clients of those workforce development providers and the students are the indirect clients of the workforce development providers. So Ministry of Education, to their credit, are looking at what that means contractually um, and so that's, that's a great example. They've done some great work in that space by clarifying that. Okay, so we're getting to the end of the um, uh, quick download, everyone. I know I've spoken really quickly. Um, look, I'm going to encourage you, because we're at uh, 1127, Jan, I'm going to encourage you just to have a little tutu, if you like, with the um, framework at, uh, at your desk, post this. Um, and what I'd like you to do is just to brainstorm, think about a service program or initiative that you deliver, and think about who your who is or are your most direct clients. So is it the child, is it the family, um, is it the parent, is it the teacher, is it the professional person that you're engaging with? And once you've identified that, then think about well, what are the outcomes that we actually deliver to those direct clients using that um, SAB C framework, so skills and knowledge, attitude, opinion, behaviour change, circumstance change. And just use that to guide some of your thinking around what you would expect a, a direct client of yours to achieve as a result of participating in your service. Um, one of the learning opportunities for us all uh, from government through to uh, providers is to really make sure we identify who our, our direct clients are before we actually go anywhere near designing client outcomes and because um, often I do see a bit of confusion or a bit of different um, perspectives uh, either within organisations or across funders and providers about who the most direct clients are. It's really important we clarified that. Thank you Sharon and thanks so much for giving us that quick overview of RBA. You're absolutely right it was a quick download but what you've done there is help us to get an understanding and quickly get up to speed with what the key principles and the concepts are and you started to introduce us to and I would say to our audience as well don't worry if you don't grasp this all in one go what we're doing today is we're providing you yeah. with some instruction and then also the resources that will enable you to take this away and to apply it in your own time. Um, um, so thank you, Sharon, for that comprehensive overview. Um, and I'm looking forward to being able to pull apart some of the issues that you've raised and also to introduce Natasha further down the line into that discussion as well. We said that we wouldn't be able to cover everything today. And one of the ways that we can cover things in more detail is a follow-up workshop with you, a uh, masterclass with you, Sharon, or do you think we could even call it a mistress class? I wonder if there's even well, we'll see. That. Um, so if you have got burning issues which you'd like to be addressed in a follow-up masterclass, don't, don't forget you can contact us on Facebook, on Twitter. There's a chat stream in the YouTube page and we've given you a number to text us on. 
I have some fantastic questions have come through already. We might just make time for one, if that's all right, Sharon. Um, yeah, so, sure. Great questions coming through. Lorna, I want to say your question about funding. We'll come to that later. That's a really good question. Great question from Paula as well. But Christina is saying, wants to know about soft outcomes. Um, and that would be after my own heart as well. You know, when we're working in areas, for example, youth development, um, and, you know, a lot of the work uh, Christina is saying is around social or emotional learning. Do you have any guidance around how RBA can be used for measuring soft outcomes? Yes. Um, look, uh, could you give me a practical example? Because I don't want, to, don't, want to be, don't want to lead anyone astray. Do you have a practical example of what an actual soft outcome might be in that space? Yeah, that's a really good question. It'll take me a little bit of time to hear back from Christina. And Christina, if you'd like to send us more, then you can. So maybe I could just venture something for now. Is that all right, Sharon? I hope, sure. Christina, I hope that's OK. Absolutely. So Sharon, I was looking at one of your workshops that you were delivering with MB um, just over the weekend. And I noticed that you were talking about you know, educational attainment in terms of exams passed. Um, but we might be dealing with some students where actually what we want to know more is the sort of the distance traveled, some softer outcomes. Yeah, maybe, and they're raising their aspirations or their sense of their own efficacy skills. Um, so I'll venture that as an example for you. When you've got soft outcomes like that, how, what can we do with RBA to capture those? Because obviously it's the magic. That's the magic. And it's not all just about passing exams. Oh, I, I totally agree. Okay. So yes, absolutely. I totally agree. I totally agree. And I think that's where the benefit of RBA kicks in. So if you think about the SAB Cs, right, the SAB Cs as categories, um, and also the fact that we really value subjective and objective data. So it's really easy, well not easy, but it's there's an opportunity to understand from the voice of the client some of the distance travelled type outcomes. So the number and percentage of clients who report they feel more empowered associated with, the number and percentage of clients who report they feel more confident to, the number and percentage of clients who report their level of self-esteem has improved. You know, um, there's a wide variety of ways that you can include um, those, you, you, we're calling them soft outcomes, but I actually, for me, they're hard outcomes. That's the magic, that's the journey, that's the opportunity of high performing organisations working with um, clients to progress their outcomes. I think those are awesome outcomes. Christina, I hope that answers your question and you're welcome to come back to us in our chat feed if you have more. Um, just one more question for you from Lassa, actually, Sharon. She says, is it true that RBA stands for really boring analysis? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you better talk to Natasha about that. <laughs> She'll give you the practical lowdown. Very funny. Ha ha. Good one. <laughs> Natasha, we're Actually, going to I love data. <laughs> Sorry, Jen. I really, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a statistician by any means, but I'll, I'll invite Natasha to talk about um, the meaningfulness of data as part of a best practice approach in RBA, because I think you about that. Natasha, would you like to respond? Sure. How well, has data I think, been meaningful to you? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we need to be able to use data to drive the decision making. So I guess as an NGO, we would always, it was always about an output. How many bums on seats? How many people were here? We did this lesson, this and this and this. But actually, we didn't really know if anything we did was any good. So you, we use the data by creating surveys to, I guess, find out whether our clients, and for us, our client, our direct clients are arangatahi. And so we would create surveys to be able to um, inform us whether or not what we do was better off for our rangatahi. So there was no point, there's no point in delivering a lesson. So we specialise in delivering sexual health educations in schools, kura kaupapa, alternate eds. No use delivering a lesson and you get to the end of it, they've learned absolutely nothing. But prior to RBA, we would just tick a box and say, yep, we delivered the lesson, great, and walk away. But we never knew whether or not we were any good at what we delivered and whether or not our rangatahi who we delivered to actually got anything out of it were better off. So did they increase their knowledge and skill in uh, learning about sexually transmitted infections? Do they actually know, have they increased their knowledge on how to use a condom? So those are the sorts of things that we've used data to drive the decision making uh, with our, in our lessons. Mm. Hope that helps. 
That's so very awesome. Awesome. And I'm going to, I'm just going to back present you, as they say, you're listening to the very awesome Natasha Kemp, who works with the even more awesome Tikaha Kaha Ote Rangatahi Trust, which was established in 1992 by a collective of dedicated women. We love to hear that. Thanks, Natasha. Um, I have another question for you, Natasha. You know, given that um, people have logged on today who may be at a different stage of their learning to you, you know, looking back on the journey, you were there since the early days, really, of mm -hmm. when RBA was being developed and sort of first implemented in New Zealand, looking back on that journey, what would your advice be to those who are thinking of using RBA in their mahi? Yeah, I think the first thing I would suggest is that actually make sure if you're going into the RBA space that you get authentic, knowledgeable and skilled RBA advice. So the, the access to shapers and associates and I mean there's different type people talk about RBA but actually when they turn it into training and embedding it within organisations they haven't quite got the foundations or the basic knowledge of RBA and how to work it within your organisation. So you need to be able to get some good workforce development and advice and training through Sharon Shea, access to Mark's DVDs. I've got to say, if you ever get to meet Mark and you get access to his DVD and you watch the DVD, when you get to meet him in person and see him present, it's actually word for word in his DVD. <laughs> you get access to, you know, good advice and good support. Um, the other thing I would say is start small. When you're going to develop your performance measures, so we've just heard 237, 237, know what your um, performance measures are and um, select your vital few that are going to showcase and story tell the work that you do within your organisation. Because we always, you know, we get into that space at times or we get in, we rely on a funder who gives us a performance measure that doesn't quite fit what we're going to, what really we want to achieve or it doesn't meet the outcomes that we actually want to drive. So start small, work in a small small service. So start maybe in, a, in one service like we did. We started in our sexual health um, space and then we've grown RBA across the organisation. And from there you start developing tools within your organisation. So you select your vital few, start in a small, in a small team service, select your vital few performance measures, and then you actually need to create or um, develop uh, templates to be able to gather your data. Because at the end of the day, this is about data for us. It's about using that data to drive the decision making within your organization. So for example, we created, um, one thing I think one of the hidden things around RBA is that there's a bit of background work you need to do in an organisation. So even though you've got your performance measures, you actually want to collect your data. So how are you going to collect it? So you need to create a template that actually, so we call it a data dictionary, and it tells us what the measure is, where the information, where the data is going to come from, and what needs to what tool you need to collect that data. So whether or not you're gonna uh, create a survey to be able to collect information or it's an internal source of data that you're going to use to be able to uh, collect the data. So there is a bit of work behind it. That's probably one of the hidden um, kind of things around RBA. There's, it's not just develop these performance measures and you run and you can go. You need to actually do a bit more work behind the scene to actually create some tools to collect the data. Um, what we did was we created some surveys to be able to, you know, gather data that informed us whether or not we were making a difference or whether or not the lessons we delivered were better off for our rangatahi. So we, we created surveys that would actually um, demonstrate an increase in skills or knowledge. So, and we would do a survey that was um, pre and post. So you'd ask a question at the beginning of the lesson. So where is your knowledge or skill base at? Before, how much do you know about this topic? And then at the end of the lesson, we would ask a few more questions and then you'd see and gauge if there's been a change. So you wanna see that at the end of the lesson, you've actually given them something that they've learnt. Um, if, if it comes back, and so the, the team would come back to the office, they would then input their data results into SurveyMonkey and then we'd measure the change. So what we'd wanna see is that the that the data was going up. So by us going into a school, we can actually show whether or not we're making a difference. If the surveys come back and actually the curve was going down, the data was going down, 
we would sit at the end of the month and say as a team, shucks, we didn't do that great this month. Um, nobody learned anything new in our sexual health education session. What are we going to do about it? So the team then have to use that data and actually say, okay, we need to make some changes and we need to adjust the lessons to fit to fit the group or the rangatahi client that we're going in to see. Or it might be a school, you know, it might be a different school. Different schools have different learning uh, opportunities or different needs. So you'd have you, the team use the data to improve the way that they deliver and improve improve I guess the content of their delivery needs to improve so they'd use that the that they'd use RBA to make improvements because at the end of the day you want to make the turn curve yeah but in, I would say in this organi in our organization all of our staff you can come to Takaha and all of our staff know RBA and they can all say two three seven and give you a conversation around how they're going to, how, they, how they're better off how our rangatahi are better off by using RBA <laughs> Did you hear that invitation there, Fano? <laughs> we'll be on your doorstep tomorrow. We'll be booking the bus. Kia ora, Natasha. And we may have time to come back to you later. Um, I would have loved to spend a little bit more time because I was hearing Natasha talk this morning about the benefit of this. You know, like I said, what's the benefit of all this? And, and clearly what you told me is not just about keeping the funders at bay. You've actually, as you've demonstrated to us there, it's about informing and enriching your own work and drawing a new level of attention to your successes to the extent that you've been award-winning in recent years. So mm -hmm. let's it's great to hear that. Um, now, not everybody, as Natasha has just described, not everybody is mates with Mark Friedman, and not everyone's mates with Sharon Shea. So part of today's event is to provide you with resources which will enable you, once you go away from this webinar, at your own desks, um, to further your understanding and your application of what works. And I'm going to um, invite Sharon now. You'll see that I'm sharing my screen with you. I'm going to have a look at um, a rather good website. Uh, I'm going to invite Sharon to talk to us, um, and I'll just ask Daniel to let me know that this is showing on the screen as well. I'm just going to invite Sharon to show, to show, talk to us about the What Works website and to talk to us about some of the tools and resources that are available here for those groups who aren't mates with Mark. Um, here's the What Works website. At the end of today's event, we're going to show you a three-minute video just to let you know how to use this site to get the best from it. Um, you may be at your desk wondering, how do I choose the right tool for me? How do I choose? How do I know if RBA is right for me or not? I'll give Sharon a chance to respond to that question shortly, but let's have a look at this really neat page on the What Works website. If we hover over the tools on the menu bar, we'll see Explore Our Tools and Approaches Matrix just here. Now, Community Research has devised this page and this site for you, thanks to all those who had input. We, our intention was not to put every single evaluation and reporting and research tool on here. Part of the problem is there's more tools out there than you can shake a stick at, and it leaves some small to medium scale NGOs feeling thwarted about how to make the right choice. So we put some of the typical and most used tools here onto this site and to enable you to start to think which one is going to work best for you. You need to be thinking about whether you want quantitative or qualitative data, for example, how you want to document learnings, if you want to use a narrative approach, and how you want to communicate your outcomes at the end, who your audience will be. You start to help you inform which is the right tool for you. It's just a matrix. Um, and you'll see one of them here is results-based accountability. You may well find that you want to do what's called triangulating your evidence, which is pick more than one tool. We're going to click on this page now, and I'm going to invite Sharon to talk to us about what are some of the resources on the results-based accountability page here. I'll click as she's talking, and how best to use OK, them. thanks, Jen. And Thanks, Jen. That's great. I encourage you to um, utilise this resource, everyone, because there's a wide variety of resources associated with RBA and other tools on the, um, on the website. So. As you can see there, there are some links to some training videos. So actually, Jan, uh, we won't click on the links, but I'll, I'll just get you to showcase a couple of those. So there you see there Mark Friedman, who's the author of RBA. So you can uh, get the real deal uh, directly from him. Um, but also um, at the bottom of the page, I think, Jan, are some links to um, some online training 
videos unfortunately it's of myself but anyway um and you can click onto youtube there it's a four four part presentation it's 60 minutes in total but it just gives you mm. more in-depth um, explanation of the components of rba so that's some, the training stuff there um you don't need to be mates with me or with Mark to utilise RBA. It is um, free to use for government agencies and also for NGOs. It is trademarked, as you can see, but it, uh, um, he's he's generous, generously offered it uh, for use for free um, for organisations such as yourself. So that's great. Um, there are a couple of local case studies um, you can see there on the right hand side. I'm just going to get Jan to quickly click on the link there. And these case studies just showcase um, how RBA has been been utilised by a couple of um, NGOs in New Zealand, which is fantastic. And also there are a wide variety of case studies associated with an embedded link um, on this page, which would take you to the MSD uh, website. Now, some of those case studies and examples are a little bit older now, but um, they give you a feel for how RBA has been used um, spe specifically within the MSD context. I also had a um, quick chat to Jan about some other more recent examples of RBA practice because I have to say that the um, um, quality of the use of RBA, <clears throat> whilst sometimes is variable, um, we can point you to some, some more recent examples. So I'll do that. I'll make a commitment to you, the audience, and also to Jan to, to get some more examples as well. So um, there's an RBA guideline and resources, result card templates, oh, yeah. uh, and a, a wide variety of, of resources there, Jan, I think, mm -hmm. that, that you'll get a lot of value out of. And we'll just scroll you down to the bottom of the page as well as part of choosing which is the right tool for you. You might just want to familiarise yourself with the pros and cons. In fact, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, anything else you wanted to point out here, Sharon? Thank you, by the way. That was really comprehensive. Yeah, uh, um, you know, what I like about the community research, you are an independent organisation and you offer constructive critique um, about the multiple tools. So um, there is a constructive critique there in the bottom left hand corner by Mango. Um, it's not about RBA per se, but it is about the concepts associated with results based management. And although some of the um, assumptions that they make I don't agree with, I think it's really important to for everyone to have a look at it. So um, Absolutely. all good, all good. It's all about being able to critique. That's great. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, thank you so much for that. And so obviously we're going to play you a short video later, which will um, uh, give you some instruction as to how to best use the What Works website as well. Um, some of you may have been um, present at our last webinar, the Outcomes Plus webinar, where Trevor McGlinchey and Garth Nolan Foreman um, had a question put to them about RBA. And um, rather than our usual question answer session, I can see there's some great questions coming through here, actually. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Fano. But oh, um, we're going to play a short clip now with Trevor McGlinchey talking about some of the um, challenges that are posed to NGOs in Aotearoa, New Zealand, who are using RBA. It may just take us a moment to start this now, but I'm going to invite David to play this link. And then, Sharon, maybe you'd like to respond and give us your comment. RBA style, uh, because it breaks it across the contribution of the organisation um, at a client level and then builds that up to a community level, and then tries to attribute that to a uh, a, a government policy initiative. It's it, it, it's interesting. It's difficult to attribute. Um, the kinds of changes that uh, communities want may or may not be reflected in the RBA turning the curve type. Uh, scenario. And so what we need to do is make sure that the the outcomes we're seeking um, go beyond a better public service target, which in themselves are okay, but not the single answer. So we might, for instance, have a um, an analysis that the swabbing of children's throats has made a huge difference in rheumatic fever levels in some areas. And that's quite true. Um, but the, the instance we stop swabbing throats and giving uh, antibiotics, 
that will increase again because we haven't actually addressed the core issue, which is cold, damp houses and overcrowded houses. So, you know, if we ask the community what the problem is, they'd say we need more and better housing. We ask government and they say we need more children having antibiotics. Um, so, yeah, RBA is useful, but I think that when it's put in the context of a better public service target, it loses some of its usefulness. Yeah, uh, back to me, Jan, is it? Thank you, Sharon. Back to you. I just wanted if you wanted to comment on that. Some good points from Trevor there. Yeah, definitely. Look, I really respect Trevor and um, what he does and, and what he stands for. So it's really great to hear that perspective. I guess for me, um, one of the critical issues there is the actual practical application of RBA, the, the relevance of it, um, how it relates to strategic thinking. And, and I think he's absolutely right in terms of uh, standing root causes versus presenting causes. And one of the opportunities I think that we have to use RBA really wisely is to actually have quite collaborative design using RBA as the platform but having real collaborative design. So how do we use the framework with integrity to reflect those multiple perspectives about what does population wellbeing look like and um, what are the right types of outcomes to measure at, at client levels and what is the contribution relationship between client level outcomes and population outcomes. So I think what he's saying is has a lot of relevance but I think it's more about design great design rather than um, the framework per se and how we use it. Thank you. We're going to play a short clip from Garth Nolan Foreman as well and then I might even ask you to give us some examples of how it looks when that is working well. Um, before we play that yeah, clip, great. Before we play that clip, um, I hear that a few people are having issues with their resolution in today's broadcast and that our chat hosts are online trying to help you with a technical fix for that. So have a look in the chat feed if that would help you. But we'll have a quick look at Garth and then, and then we'll ask ourselves, so if these are the problems, how does it look when it's working well? Sure. And straight over to you, Sharon. Okay. Big risk with RBA, which has, as Trevor said, uh, quite a number of uh, uses, but the big risk is when um, some external party like government funders impose the measures um, rather than the agencies working out what success looks like for them and from a ground up um, a human, a people centred approach. Um, and in fact, the, there was a little study done in New South Wales when the New South Wales government introduced RBA with centralised imposed measures and it had no effect on the impact of agencies. In fact, all the agencies just treated it like another hoop you had to jump through to get your money. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, undermined their learning and improvement strategies because it just uh, was uh, a rigid system that was imposed. That's not necessarily how RBA has to be if we allow it to be flexibly used by all the organisations um, on, a, on a ground up basis. And, and we need to train the organisations not to be seduced by the easily measured, but to focus on what's most important. It's always must be much better to be generally right than to be precisely wrong. And the big risk is we focus on the easily measured, the preciseness, but we are measured the wrong thing. Um, yeah, number of mouth swabs rather than children growing up happy, healthy, uh, warm homes. Yeah, uh, again, uh, you know, I, I think Garth makes some excellent points. For me, again, it's about high quality implementation of the framework, ensuring that the design process is robust, that you've got informed people around the table, not just um, uh, those who deal with, um, you know, sort of macro level issues all the time. You actually need people who are on the ground who know the real deal in terms of family, whānau, um, people who, what people's needs are and things like that. So I really, really favour co-design. Um, that's my personal preference. And there are some agencies doing really good co-design. So for example, just yesterday, I worked with um, ACC. They've got a new disability support services model and they are holding four co-design sessions in terms of what what potential client outcomes look like for this new service um, right across New Zealand. Ministry of Health have done some great co-design work, um, Ministry of Education have done some great co-design work and also MSD um, in certain areas as well. Um, 
so that's what I favour. And it's unfortunate to hear the New South Wales experience it's about um, the model. It's more about the practical application of the model and the and and not realising really the opportunities that we could realise if we use the models in a smart way. I'm really pleased to hear you talk about that, Sharon, because um, obviously we were really hopeful that today wouldn't just be about the tool itself and instructions as to how to use it, but modelling what good practice looks like. It's disastrous if we get it wrong. It creates unnecessary burden on groups who are already overburdened on their day-to-day -day basis. And it's so great to hear of those examples when it's working well. We know that there are some funders logged on today and we want to be about modelling and advocating good practice wherever possible. So co-design being really important and it helps us avoid some of those common pitfalls that Garth and um, Trevor were talking about. Um, we're approaching our final moments of today's webinar. Again, we've had some great questions come in. Lorna, I hope that that uh, helped to answer the question that you had for us. If you still have a burning issue, I mean, the question now is, where do we take this next? You might be at your desk on your own. You may be one of the teams of people who we know are logged on today. There are some entire teams around the country who have chosen to log on and to watch today's webinar to get them started on their RBA journey. Community research is here as far as we're able to, a small national NGO working to provide you with capability building resources in this area. If you've got a question which you, you know, sort of the what next question for you, we'd really love to hear from you. We're going to cloud source a mistress class with Sharon Shea in the new year. Um, and we'd like it to be informed by your burning issues. You might be at the starting point. You may be midway in your application of RVA. You may have a specific question that's specific to your context or a particular theme that you're working with. Let us know which questions you would like to address and Sharon and I are going to take these away and see how we can come up with something that works for you in the new year. I have a final question from Budgeting Services or we're going to incorporate a question that's come in from Budgeting Services um, and um, and really would like to hand back to you now, Sharon and Natasha, as the experts with whom it's been such a great pleasure to work today. Sharon, so much expertise that you bring to this work. We really are lucky in Aotearoa, New Zealand, to have you as such a leading exponent in this field. And Natasha, awesome mahi, and so great to hear sort of from you personally about the successes, you know, the good news story that you've experienced of applying RBA in your work. Mm -hmm. um, I my final question to you, for budgeting services, is like it's kind of so. What's the big deal with RBA? Why? I mean, I think the question comes with a spirit of curiosity. Of sorry, I've just lost it on my screen here now. But there was a real sense of curiosity. Is curiosity is why is this the tool that the government is investing in so heavily, and why is it worth the investment? And I suppose I would put that back to both of you. Why invest in RBA from your own perspectives? Um, and uh, Natasha, would you be willing to kick off first for us from your perspective? Why make, why bother? Why make the investment? Well, I think it, it is for us and our organisation is about um, showcasing our success and, our, and sharing our story around the better offness that we're creating with rangatahi. It is around our rangatahi and our whānau telling us that um, from what, from engaging with Te Kaha o Te Rangatahi, they are better off. So, I mean, it's it's no longer about, yep, we, we did a lesson or we engaged with whānau and rangatahi and then we walk away. Then they tell us that they're actually increasing their skills and knowledge. They're, um, in, they've got a change in attitude or opinion about a kaupapa or a topic and that there may be a change in circumstance. So now this is when Sharon talks about co-design it is around that partnership and relationship of provider and client or and about sharing in our success and their journey um, we invest in rba because we're able to show that we and demonstrate that with rangatahi engaging in our service they're better off yeah 
where we were no we weren't able to do that before. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. Um, Natasha, look, um, the reason why we get out of bed in the morning is to is to make a positive difference, uh, and this tool just enables us to showcase that if used wisely. Um, we have to have a common language around outcomes. It's not as Natasha said, all about we delivered ten lessons. It's about did we make a positive difference in the lives of the people who attended those lessons, and are we contributing? Can we say that we're really contributing to population level well-being? And this just happens to be a tool that has great utility, um, is, 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 is able to be used with integrity in that space. So the opportunity is ours, everyone. Um, we should go for it. We should use it. We should, we should take the opportunity and showcase our point of difference. Kia ora, Sharon, for a great rounding remark. Kia ora, Natasha, for an inspiring insight and a glimpse into your world. Uh, Kia ora whanau, tēnē te mihi atu, atu ki a koutou katoa who are uh, logged on today to watch this webinar. Help us crowdsource a mistress class with Sharon Shea in the new year. Um, we'd love to see you logged on as well on the 23rd of November with Martin Kaipo and Kay Marie Don talking about raising whanau aspirations in Northland and Martin's perspective as a busy service provider um, about leadership and raising whanau aspirations. Um, and thank you to all of you who've been online for this webinar today. We'll look forward to receiving your um, survey forms and we hope to see you logged on today. We're going to, uh, again, we're going to play you a quick three minute clip to show you a little bit more about the What Works site. So, no reira, teina koutou katoa. Kia ora. Welcome to What Works. This website can help you figure out what difference you and your organization are making. Take TUI, for example. TUI is currently under some pressure, swirling in questions, challenging his organization's very existence. Are we making a difference for the people we serve? Could we be more effective? How can we show real results? TUI's organization runs a program designed to help unemployed young people develop work skills. Now TUI's being asked to prove that what they're doing is helping, but he doesn't really know how to go about it. What Works has a series of tools designed to make this easier. You're one step ahead of TUI, given you've been introduced to us already. Our homepage contains some useful information to help you begin. The Consider tab is a good place to get some basic information about what evaluation is and how to do it properly. When it comes to proving that what you're doing is having impact, you need to walk through some basic steps. The Get Started tab contains a number of resources to help you formulate a good evaluation plan, from defining what you need to evaluate to making sure the findings get used. Now that TUI has identified what he needs to know, he can move on to choosing some data gathering and evaluation tools. The Tools tab is divided into two sections. The first is designed to help you choose the right framework or approach. The Methods, Tools, Techniques section contains the different ways of collecting data. TUI is stuck for where to go next and needs help to choose the right tool. To help with that, we have a handy Tools and Approaches matrix, which contains an overview of popular tools and approaches that can be filtered in various ways. TUI thinks he's found a good framework and toolset that matches his organization's evaluation plan, but we'll have a bit of a look through the various case studies under the Stories tab first. It contains a selection of user stories about organizations' experiences using particular tools, so you can see what has worked for them. We're always looking for new stories, if you have an example to share, please contact Community Research. TUI can see organizations similar to his using the approach he picked, so he can see how it's going to work for him. With a good plan and tool set in place, TUI is well on the way to answering those original questions. Most importantly, TUI's organization will build good evidence about their outcomes and learn from the evidence gathered. What works, works best when organizations like TUI's share their experiences with the wider community so other groups can benefit from the information too. The Share tab contains guidance on becoming a learning organization and ways to share what you learn with others. There are tips on how to present your findings to service users, your board, funders and the general public. TUI is going to take some more time to explore the website fully. We encourage you to take some time to have a look through the resources and see if they can help you with your work.